People told themselves their past with stories, explained their present with stories, foretold the future with stories. The best place by the fire was kept for the storyteller. Chapter 7. The Devil is Prophet. From what has been related in this narrative, it is evident that the devilish beings know what happens at great distances and even in faraway countries. They have also expert knowledge of world history. The spirit which possessed one of the boys often revealed things of a far removed past which could not have been known by any natural means. More than that, he predicted coming events days and weeks beforehand. These events subsequently occurred as foretold, to the amazement of everyone. Fallen angels do not lose all their knowledge. As a matter of fact, we poor mortals cannot even imagine the extent of their craftiness and intellectual acumen. Visitors were often told, in the minutest details, the evils, even the most secret sins they had committed. They could not stand it, and they disappeared with the greatest possible haste. At times, he even attempted to lecture people for their moral defects. To a neighbor he said, You toper, were you not present when the priest was preaching against drunkenness? Yet you have gone to so-and-so to get a tippler's nose? You are the cause of your daughter's illness and of her cattle's disease. On Palm Sunday, he gave a good scolding to a native of Ilford. You swiller, did you not hear the priest in the Schwanzenstall, thus repeating his epithet for church, saying nobody must go to the public house this week? Your obedience is edifying indeed. Have you not been with the baker of Flaxenden in the tavern? Have you not imbibed a copious quantity of beer? Other people had to expiate even more severely the cravings of curiosity. Pale as though struck by lightning, they fled away terrified, for the demon had revealed to them mysteries of an evil nature and had charged them with serious offenses committed in former days, and which they had imagined to be quite unknown to anyone but themselves. The mayor of a village in the neighborhood of Strasbourg said once to his counselors after a municipal meeting, Gentlemen, who goes with me next Sunday to Schlittengein? We will go to see the possessed boy. Several men agree with the proposal. But listen, Monsignor Mayor, remarked one of them, we are told that Satan may there put the flashlight of truth on our own lives. Tomorrow is Saturday, replied the mayor. We'll go to confession. Then, at the first mass on Sunday, we'll go to Holy Communion. We shall then be all right, and the devil can reproach us with nothing. This was agreed to and done. On Sunday, they went to Schlickenheim and arrived at St. Charles's. They rang the bell. A nursing sister appeared and inquired their errand. We should like very much to see the possessed child, answered the mayor. Come with me, gentlemen, she responded. I'll show you the way. No sooner had the sister opened the faithful door than the possessed boy cried, Look here, the mayor, with his adjoint, and others of the council are approaching. You did not trust your good stars, otherwise you would not have gone to church yesterday to scrape the filth from your conscience. But one of you has not done it well. There is a former beetroot thief here. The man referred to became terrified. His cheeks went red and glowing. He stammered out. Yes, but I have put on the ground the money to cover the expense of what I took. The owner never had it grinned the satanic spirit. Gentlemen, let us go, said the mayor. He may what otherwise reproach me with something unpleasant. In a thrice the company had disappeared. When, however, the incident was more widely known, the exposed beetroot thief became the laughing stock of all. Thibault predicted several persons' deaths, 
two hours before the passing away of a woman, he knelt on his bed and imitated the actions of a bell ringer at a funeral. On another occasion, he likewise told concerning a man who died on the following day, and his effort was so exhausting that he was bathed in sweat. On Saturday, the eve of the third Sunday of Lent, he foretold that next day several hundred people would arrive, the rumor having spread of the children's deliverance. This happened. That evening, Satan was in an exultant mood and shouted for joy because so many people had missed their Sunday Mass on account of him. He mentioned events which had happened 20, 30, even 100 years before with such certainty and accuracy as could not have been excelled had he been a personal witness to these happenings. Monsignor Tresch was nominated to the, to the morality of Ilford in January 1869. Nobody in the district knew of the appointment. The possessed boy, however, addressed him already as Monsignor the Mayor. Indeed, he had previously said to his mother, I am so furious that I am almost bursting. And why? asked the woman. Because the skunk has been made mayor. I and our lot are frantic with rage. It was the hour when the nomination papers were forwarded from the prefecture of Colmar. When Monsignor Tresh entered his room, the boy shouted, You are a churchman. You have been at Sliden. You are telling a fib, retorted Monsignor Tresh. Tell me where I have been. In stat. What stat? asked Monsignor Tretch. In Schlet, responded the demon. This was a fact. The demon, speaking through the boy, went on. You have also seen the rag gatherers. Uh, this abusive term he used as a nickname for the Capuchin fathers. And you have brought them money that they may make rubbish. Uh, abusive terms in which the demon alluded to offerings for masses. In very deed, Monsignor Tresh shortly before called at the Capuchin Monastery of Dornacht near Basel and had asked the Reverend Guardian to say two masses for the deliverance of the boys. Not a living soul in Ilfert knew about it except Monsignor Brobeck, who had accompanied him. In a particularly grave crisis, the possessing demon revealed that several priests, mentioning their names and parishes, had written about him in the civil and ecclesiastical authorities. The cleric of this and of that have, he said, communicated with the high cleric who wears the hood, bishop, and the man with the great cap, mitre, has sent word to Mulhouse concerning the two little dogs. There he was referring to the possessed boys. Then turning toward one of the sisters who watched him, and you, Bowler, he continued, you with your Geisenbolen and Katzenwaddle, these are abusive epithets for rosaries, you shall not sleep three nights longer in the little adjoining room. All persons present were amazed, especially the sisters, who had not the least idea of their impending removal. That same evening, a letter came from the convent ordering the nuns to leave the children within two days and return back to Mulhouse. One day, little Joseph sent a Monsignor Tresh. I want to recall an incident of your youth. You went to the forest to hew wood. A snake crawled near. What did I do to it? queried Monsignor Tresh. You killed it under the invocation of the three names, the Holy Trinity replied the possessing fiend. And do you know you killed one of my companions? Had you not invoked the three names while slaying him, you would have wandered about all night without finding your way out of the wood. Monsignor Tresh remembered the incident well. Often did the possessing boy mention events of the, of the beginning of the human race, quite in harmony with the scripture account. He was present, he said, at the fall of our, first, of our first parents and at the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. You would not be obliged to bow, pray, and to whisper through the great, confess, if I had not plucked an apple for Eve. 
Now and then he went back to past times. During the Swedish war, he said once, the old Schwanzenstall, the demon's term for the cemetery church, was not destroyed, but the priest was killed at the altar whilst holding aloft the monstrance. Then a soldier tried to behead the statue of the great lady. He could not, but fell backward and died. I took him and many others with me. The great lady allows no stealing from the Schweizenstall. He gave also details of awful crimes committed at Ilford in former times. It was March 12, 1868. Monsignor Tresh was again with the children and found them fairly quiet. Suddenly, the wicked one manifested his presence. Here am I, he shouted, with a strange hoarse man's voice. Where do you come from? asked Monsignor Tresh. From Garel. Who is he? A bookbinder. Where from? From the place of your two visitors. What two visitors? asked Monsignor Tresh. The tall one and the old one, replied the demon. What are their names? Kinesi, Monsignor Spies, answered the demon. Kinesi, and as to the other one, I do not know it. He disgusts me. What, asked Monsignor Tresh, were you doing at the bookbinders? I have spent the whole day with him. He has bound a beautiful book, which he looked through with delight. That made me happy, and I remained with him all day long. Does, asked Monsignor Tresh, the bookbinder live far away from my tall friend? No, only the distance of a few houses. Do you visit the tall one? No, his door is too low for me to get through. What frightens you there? asked Monsignor Tresh. The great lady who stands outside. And my other friend, the old one, how do you treat him? I want to know nothing about him. He sickens me, exclaimed the demon. Do you not visit him? No. He carries around object which prevents me from calling on him. Is it not, asked Monsignor Tresh, the cross you once saw here? No. It is something which the priest holds aloft, and this would sting me if I went to him. This was a relic of the holy cross contained in a silver cruciform case. Monsignor Tresh immediately sent an account of this talk to Monsignor Spice, who went to the bookbinder, almost his neighbor, in the same street, the Rittergas, and asked him whether on such and such a day he had not bound a book and read in it. Monsieur Garel, whose memory was unreliable, looked through his register and declared that, on that day, he had bound a Bible for the Lutheran pastor of Celestat and that he had read some passages in it. His visitor, after receiving this information, showed him the letters from Ilford. How comes it, exclaimed the, the astounded bookbinder, that Satan concerns himself with me? Nothing to be astonished at, replied the visitor. Faith teaches us that Satan goeth round about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He then explained to him something of the nature of the evil spirits and their mischievous influence on the destiny of men. An extraordinary exhibition of occult knowledge occurred on July 24, 1798. A very zealous priest, a native of Ilford, Abbé Jean Bocquelin, then curate of Niederspet, was condemned to death by the Revolutionary Tribunal of Colmar for the alleged offense of violating the immigration law, but, in reality, out of hatred of the Catholic faith. The holy man was shot dead that same evening in the sand pit just outside the town. His belongings were kept by his friends like holy relics. His blood-stained shirt remained in the Bulkland family. On June 28, 1842, a terrible fire broke out at Ilford and one of the houses belonging to the Bokelans became a prey to the flames. However, the box containing the letters of the martyred priest and also his breviary, chalice, and other belongings were saved. 
The bloody shirt, however, was in the confusion carried off by a thief. All inquiries as to the whereabouts of the relic were fruitless. One day, Professor Lachman asked the boy Thibault in the presence of Monsignor Tresh, Say, Thibault, do you know Bacalin? Do not mention to me that fighting knight, answered the possessed. I want to know nothing about him. Thirty years hence, at his exhumation, his name will be spoken of with reverence by all tongues. Three decades later, in 1897, there was published the Abbé Salter's book, Jean Bocquelin, the last Alastian martyr of the French Revolution, by which the memory of this holy priest was rescued from oblivion and his virtues again glorified. Not long after the publication of that book, a beautiful monument was erected to his memory. It was placed opposite the new presbytery in his native village of Ilford. A few days after the first mention of the name, Bocquelin, to the possessed boy, one of the members of the family to which the martyr priest belonged asked Tybo, Say, what has become of the shirt of Bocquelin? Hold thy tongue, screeched the devil. A good boy, good in Satan's eye, has stolen it. Otherwise, it would later have on been made into relic covers. Chapter 8 New Plots Pitiful beyond his expression were the tortures of the poor boys. The hellish master tormented them horribly, especially when his fury was roused by the sight of the blessed metal or other holy object. Then the poor victims tore and smashed to pieces all that came within reach. Any effort at mastering this rage was opposed with utmost strength, and it was often enormously difficult to overcome it. Repeatedly, Satan declared that he must prefer to dwell in a strong, grown-up man because it would be more difficult to overcome him there. But, when haunting the body of a child, he was allowed to use only such strength as befitted that more feeble body. Monsignor Tresh, almost a daily visitor, was the subject of the lost angel's great aversion. I have a bone to pick with you, he one day said. Shortly after, one of Monsignor Tresh's cows broke a leg. Something already, said the spirit. But this is not all. A few days afterwards, two calves died. Something else, grinned the demon. But I have not finished with them yet. After a certain time, the mayor fell down his staircase and broke his forearm. When this misfortune happened, the fallen angel, with scornful laughter, was already detailing it to the visitors. In the month of May 1868, Monsignor Tresh had purchased a pig. The next day, this earth swallowed healthy animal lost all appetite and began to pine away. The veterinary surgeon not being able to locate any disease, Monsignor Mayer determined to investigate in other ways. He placed in the sty a blessed medal of St. Benedict. Immediately, the animal was well again and took its food as usual. At his next visit to the possessed boy, the enemy gave him a word of explanation. I am not able to enter thy house any more, he said. We are obliged to fly away over it. The filth, so he described to the objects suspended in houses, prevents our entry. In several other Ilford houses, the evil being likewise made uncanny noises, especially in the home of Monsignor Kleber, Benjamin. This family had much to endure from him. For example, on one occasion, when they called a priest to bless some farm buildings, in the Brobeck and Zerbach families, the evil spirit also caused much annoyance. Having had in an upper room an infernal witch's vigil, he boasted exultantly, Did you not hear last night? We made a row to deafen your ears. He delighted greatly in causing the poor boys to trace figures of dogs and snakes. Such we have in hell, he added. They are our masters. One day, Tybo was complaining to the nursing sister. I am covered with lice. She looked and saw that numberless red lice did indeed appear. Immediately she began, 
with the assistance of three visitors, to belabor his head with brush and comb. The more vermin they destroyed, however, the more appeared. The boy's father became impatient and cried, Wait, Satan, I will drive your emissaries away. He fetched holy water, sprinkled the head of the child, and said, In the name of the Blessed Trinity, I command thee to leave this body. Immediately, the creatures disappeared. The same remedy was used on behalf of the other boy, Joseph, who likewise had begun to complain of a similar affliction. If a visitor came into the room without some sacred emblem on his person, it very commonly happened that his watch stopped, on which occurrence the satanic spirit jeered. Why do you not play this trick on me? once asked Monsignor Tresh. If only I could, cried the demon. I do so with joy. During summer of 1868, the boys were left quiet for some time. On the return of the crisis, Monsignor Tresh asked the diabolic possessors where he had been. I have been on many errands. Have you been in Spain? A revolution was sweeping that country. Yes, replied the demon. There we were most busy. There many have fallen. Have you had hand in chasing away the queen? asked Monsignor Tresh. Oh, surely. And why? In Spain there is a priest almost in every house. Are there really so many priests there? Oh, yes, cried the demon. More than here. Then he added, If only I could win you over and the priests here to my cause. I could stay here, but you are obstinate, and so are Spitz, the demon's name for Monsignor Spice, of Celestat, and the great baller, his epithet for Martineau. Say, asked Monsignor Tresh, is it not true that Mary, the mother of Christ, prays for me, and I am protected in my constant opposition to thee? Hold thy tongue, be silent, commanded the fiend in a fury. The demon confessed also that he assisted the great murderer, Tropmon, in his crimes. Chapter 9. The Agonies of the Victims The sufferings of the boys could be likened to a continual martyrdom. Even a glance at them inspired terror and pity. During the two first years in which they were obliged to remain mostly in bed, they often crossed their legs in most unnatural manner and entwined them rope-like so strongly that they could not be pulled one from the other. Then suddenly, with speed of lightning, they bounded back to their freedom. Often they stood on head and feet at the same time, with their bodies right upward, a position from which they could not be changed by any outside pressure until it pleased the devilish master to withdraw. When in bed, the boys often traced on the wall horrible caricatures of fiendish faces, to which they spoke and sported. If a rosary were placed on their bed during sleep, they immediately disappeared under the clothes, only reappearing when the beads were removed. Often, when seated in a chair, the boy was lifted by an invisible power, was then either let fall or else was flung into one corner of the room, while the chair was cast into the other. His mother, seated once with him on a bench, experienced the same fright, but, though thrown against the wall, was uninjured. Frequently, the poor boy's body swelled to bursting point. Then he vomited sea froth, feathers, and seaweed. Feathers were likewise seen on his garments, which gave forth a very bad odor. At times, the boys climbed, with feline agility, to the remotest boughs of trees in the garden, without, however, breaking them. In the living room, where there was no oven, the heat occasionally became so unbearable that people expressed agonizing amazement. Thereupon, the evil spirit would say, I am a good stroker, am I not? Is it not hot near me? The mother, who slept in the same room, sometimes was quite unable to endure the heat. She then rose, 
sprinkled the lads and herself with holy water, and the normal temperature came back. The same happened to the nuns who were watching the patients. What must be the ire of God's anger that torments the lost angels in perdition? The words of the prophet recur to one's mind. Which of you can dwell with devouring fire? Which of you shall dwell with everlasting burnings? From the prophet Isaiah, chapter 33, verse 14. The good nuns, Sister Severa and Methula, had a frightful task in watching over and tending the boys. They saw window curtains turned down by invisible hands and closed windows burst open with strange rapidity. They witnessed chairs being overturned, also tables and other furniture being moved by spirit hands all over the room. Sometimes the house shook, as though by an earthquake. When a priest or other pious Catholic made a call, the possessed boys crept in all haste under the table or the bed or leapt from the window. On the other hand, visits from so-called quote-unquote liberal Christians gave them great joy. He is one of ours, they would shout. What a boon if all were like them. After Tybo's arrival in St. Charles's, the diabolic spirit uttered no word for three days. Only on the fourth day, at 8 p.m., he spluttered, I am here. I am in a fury. Who are you? asked the sister. I am the Lord of Darkness, he cried, and imitated the cry of a calf about to be strangled. When angry, the boy's features were dreadful to behold. He then recognized no one, not even his own mother. He tore his clothes to pieces and smashed everything near him until he was overpowered. On receiving a garment into which a blessed metal had been sewn, he made it his first business to tear away the lining and wrench out the sacred object. His deafness was so great that he failed to hear Monsignor the Superior Stumpf firing some pistol shots near his ear. He watched the motion of the finger on the trigger, and then, even once the loud report was still echoing through the room, he cried, He wants to shoot, but cannot manage it. One day, Monsignor Le Superior came from Strasbourg on a visit to St. Charles's Institute. He drove in a carriage in company of a parish priest. Thibault was drumming with his fingers on the window pane. No sooner did he perceive the visitors than he exclaimed, Look, there comes the dung beetle. Dreckler, wait, I'm going to play him a trick. A couple of seconds later, a wheel became detached from its axle, and the visitors had to walk the rest of the way. To play nasty pranks, to torment and torture in every possible way, the quote-unquote two little dogs, meaning the two boys, that was the demon's constant occupation. For four years, the poor victims had to remain in this awful predicament. Many people in the metropolis absolutely refused to believe in the diabolical possession and remained impervious even to the findings of the first official inquiry. After two more years, however, a second commission of investigation was formed. It meant the end of the long torture and the liberation of the unfortunate boys. In May 1868, Monsignor Brobeck and Monsignor Mayer decided to take Taibo to Notre Dame des Hermites in the hope of a cure in that place of pilgrimage. The journey was safely accomplished. Two Benedictine fathers kept the boy under close observation until the reality of the possession became clear to them. Father Nepomuk said over him three times, but without success, the liturgical prayers of exorcism. He then advised the pilgrims to go to the bishop with the request that the prelate would take authoritative steps towards the liberation of the children from their ghastly affliction. The Capuchin fathers of Dornoch had already given the same advice. An officer of an African regiment quartered at Mulhouse, who was very fond of sensational sights, 
came once to visit the possessed boys. As soon as they saw him, they roused his conscience with such a thorough examination in classical French that he was overcome and rushed away terrified. It was the occasion of his resuming religious duties after a long neglect and being sincerely converted. A similar experience befell a school inspector of Mulhouse and two gentlemen of the town. The frightful sight of effects of diabolic malignity in the boys was the occasion of making good Christians of them all. On Tuesday morning, March 3rd, 1868, Monsignor Berner, the father of the boys, went to market. In the outskirts of the city, he met a little man, a wandering needle and thread merchant known to everyone in the district. This man assailed Berner with bitter reproaches. You are, he cried, the cause of your children's misfortune. You befoul them with occultism. Berner defended himself as best he could, but was unable to convince his adversary. When he returned home, the boy shouted at him from a distance. What a nice scene the little merchant made with you. He has reproached you with playing mysterious games with your boys. Was he also one of your own? asked the father. Yes, replied the demon through the boy's mouth. Yes, already I have him in my net. Then, replied Berner, I will say one paternoster for the poor man's deliverance and will forget his insolence to me. Hearing this prayer, the devilish being exclaimed, Alas, now my net is being torn. The man eludes me. On a fast day, the demon caused the boy to shout most loudly for meat, contrary to church regulations. In so doing, he used the French language, Go get me some meat. On the other days, it never came into his head to ask for meat. He supremely hated prayer. One day, Monsignor Treche brought with him an old book of the year 1648, containing some powerful prayers against evil spirits. He had scarcely opened it when he was simply overwhelmed with every opprobrious epithet that can be imagined. Very well, said the mayor. You begin and I continue. The boys jumped on their bed crying. You always carry with you these old dirty leaves. And Thibault added, You turn me into a lunatic. I cannot listen to you any more. I become mad and I ought to be taken to Steffensfeld, the asylum. Then they seemed about to leap at the mayor with the purpose of biting and scratching him. He held forth his hand and challenged them to strike it if they dared. But, although they tried to do so, their blows fell right and left ineffectively. On other occasions, they rarely succeeded in their evil designs against opponents. It happened that Monsignor le Abbe Schranster, who argued against the demon, received a scratch wound from Thibault. This priest took no heed of the insignificant injury, which ached but little. On the second day, however, his finger was noticeably swollen and very painful. He took fright and bathed the wound in holy water. The next day, all pain was gone, as was also every trace of the scratch. Another time, the boy took the chair and flung it against the abbey, whose head escaped by a mere inch or so. The abbe, seeing him about to repeat the assault, touched the boy's hand with holy water. This sufficed. The boy released the hold of the chair and betook himself, grunting and growling, into a corner. Chapter 10. Satan's Confessions. Monsignor Martineau mentions in one of his letters how the worthy mayor of Ilford extracted from the possessed boy a declaration as to which religion is true. Thou knowest it, said the devilish inhabitant of the boy's body. Thy religion is the only true one. All others are false. But how is it, asked Monsignor Tresh, that you acknowledge such a fact? I am forced to it by the three who are above, the Holy Trinity, said the demon, adding, I must also inform you 
that we have no power whatever, we demons, over people who think and act as you do. We are powerless against those who confess their sins with sorrow in their heart and receive worthily the body of Christ. We can do nothing against those who invoke the Great Lady, to whom also we owe our misfortune. We cannot harm the sincere followers of the Great Teacher, whom we hate. That is, the people who are loyally devoted to dem Vater aller Hund, the father of all the dogs, which was an abusive name for the Pope, and are devout members of dem Grossen Schwanzenstall, the demon's term for the Catholic Church. Question by Monsignor Martineau about his name. My name, he said, and thine are as well known to me as to thee, but I have my reasons for refusing to say what it is. If you were a Jew, he added, I'd answer in all languages. Next day, Monsignor Tresch asked the spirit why he was so headstrong and rude with the two gentlemen from Celestat. I cannot, was the reply, stand that spitz, nor endure the other one, the man who lives in Chat Town, but is not a native of it, prays too much. What he has, he gives to the poor, retaining for himself scarcely a few rags. He knocks at the door of the rich to find relief for the poor. I cannot bear him. Never again mention his name to me. To Monsignor Tresh, the spirit was equally rude. One day he compared him to a great far-spreading branch. But you are a skinflint, a starveling, he added. You give me nothing, not even your potato peelings. You bestow all on the great lady and her dog. Even in your home you keep the great dame with her little dog on her lap. Where is she placed, he, he was asked. Over the door? Yes, but that is not the one you fear? No, answered the fiend. But the one you keep in your little box. The one with the little dog on the lap. The statuette to which the spirit undoubtedly referred was a gift from the mayor's aunt from St. Pilt, and a great object of veneration to him. One Sunday morning, once the church bells tolled the sacred mysteries on the altar, Satan flew into a venerable frenzy. Wait, said the nursing sister to him. The time is near when you will have to depart. Can I not expel you myself? Your nose is too short for that, jeered the demon. Who can do it then, inquired the sister. Charles Bray was the reply. The fiend possessing Thibault also declared that he would be defeated in the presence of twelve persons, and that the little dog, Thibault, would then recover the sense of hearing. But, added the evil one, I shall put up a good defense. Our narrative will show how stout a resistance he actually did offer to the exorcist to expel him from his victim, and that this event did take place in the presence of twelve witnesses. A holy priest, an ex-chaplain of St. Charles's, came purposely to Schlichtenheim on a visit to the boys. Entering the room, he uttered the Latin greeting, In nomine Jesu omne genuflacitor. In the name of Jesus, let every knee bend in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. Immediately, the possessed boy collapsed in a heap. Then he began to moan and cry, and, with a howl, crawled under the bed. The priest repeated the same words and ordered the boy to approach. On receiving a refusal, the priest put holy water under the bedstead. The boy crept out of the hiding place, turned whimperingly on the floor, and then hastened to a corner as far away from the priest as possible. Mademoiselle Marie Spez, sister of Monsignor Spez, called one day and touched one of the boys with a finger on which she wore a blessed medal of St. Hubert. Cease, cried the possessed boy. You have fire on you. You burn me. Then he grinned. The bombs did not damage thy hut. Thou hast the great lady in it. He alluded to the siege of Selstadt in 1814, during which the house of the Spies family remained intact. The same house was also unharmed in the War of 1870. Chapter 11. The Episcopal Commission. 
After the lapse of nearly five years, the diocesan authorities took the case in hand. His Lordship Bishop Brace remained always amongst the most skeptical. Not until the report of his own Episcopal Commission of Inquiry was issued did he become convinced of the fact of the diabolical possession. At the instance of the Dean of Altrick, he ordered a special ecclesiastical investigation. For this purpose, he sent on April 13, 1869, to Ilford, three theologians, Monsignor Stumpf, superior of the Great Seminary, Monsignor Freiberger, dean of Essenheim, and Monsignor Sester, rector of Mulhouse. The parish priest of the village being temporarily absent, it was the mayor, Monsignor Tresch, who received these gentlemen and accompanied them to the Berner family. There they met the mother of the two boys. The diabolic possessor had already predicted their arrival and had even named who they would be. The man who comes from Strasbourg harms me most, he added. He is sent here by the cleric with a big cap. A mitre, he alluded to the bishop. But I shall play the fool with him and with the others. The inquiry lasted all morning. It quite convinced the commission of the true nature of the outstanding affliction. The boys became intensely excited. On being touched with the metal of the Blessed Virgin, Taibo hid himself under the bed and Joseph leapt out of the window. The reverend gentleman put into written form every possible detail of evidence available. Witnesses were heard, whose statements tallied with the investigator's own observations. At last, the commission drew up its report and forwarded it to Strasbourg. Monsignor the Superior Stumpf advised the bringing over of the boys to a convent in the Episcopal city where the exorcism could take place. This plan was in agreement with the ideas of Monsignor Spitz, who proposed for this purpose the orphanage of St. Charles near Schlichtingheim, one of the institutions which belonged to the convent of all saints. The vicar general, Monsignor Marula, expressed the wish of having the elder boy removed first. This was agreed to, and Taibo was taken to the orphanage. There he remained for five weeks, tended by the nuns until the time of his deliverance. A previous inquiry was to have taken place, but failed to materialize, owing to peculiar circumstances. This fact was well known to the evil spirit. In the presence of Monsignor Spies and Martineau, Monsignor Tresch asked the elder boy during a crisis, Tell me, where have you been today? Oh, replied the demon, speaking my medium of the boy. Oh, I have not been wasting my time. I was today in Strasbourg. And what were you doing there? I have been playing the fool on five priests. How? I donned a cassock and succeeded in putting them off the track. Soon after, these gentlemen were informed that an inquiry was to have taken place at the instance of the ecclesiastical authorities, but the task was not at all to the liking. There was also told of the priest who was entrusted with it, this latter king to Ilford, but saw neither parents nor boys. He did not even cross the threshold of the house. The inquiry fell through, and the deadly malignity of the possessing fiend was thereby strengthened. The most prominent man among the skeptics was the schoolmaster of Ilford. During school hours, he poured ridicule on the events in the Berner family and ended by saying, the devil, in fact, does not exist. Shortly afterwards, he went with two of his children to his native village in the neighborhood of Colmar to settle some private affairs. On the Champ de Mars of this town, he saw a company of soldiers drilling. Posting himself in front of these, I am Napoleon, he shouted. Napoleon, the emperor of the French. On saying this, he took a paper, went straight up to the commanding officer, and acted as though about to confer a military decoration upon him. He had suddenly become mad. He was taken to the hospital, and then to Steffenfield Lunatic Asylum. The evil spirit had foretold this incident also. It had done so with mockery and laughter. A great number of conversions, however, resulted from this striking case of lunacy. 
many people recovered their long-lost religious fervor. One woman knocked at the door of the Redemptorist Monastery at Lanster and expressed a desire to make a general confession. I saw the poor children, she said, and the devil seemed to take a great delight in me. I am anxious about the state of my soul. A brigadier of the military police, who long ago had lost his faith through reading evil books, paid casual visits with Monsignor Tresh to the Burner family. Each time he called, the possessing spirit was quiet and did not reveal himself. The man, therefore, was inclined to treat the matter as humbug. He happened, however, to come one day, accompanied by the mayor, whilst the crisis of particular violence was in progress. The sight of so appalling a scene was enough to convince the unbeliever and to shake him to the depths of his being. I am going to turn over a new leaf, he told his wife. I'm going to become a fervent Christian. He kept his word. He was present at divine service as often as his duty allowed and received the sacraments every month. Chapter 12. A Scene at St. Charles's. In an interesting message to his parents at Ribbyville, dated October 5th, 1869, Monsignor Charles André, the gardener of St. Charles, describes the following impressive scene of which he himself was an eye and ear witness. On Saturday, Sister Damase, he said, asked me to take Tybo to the chapel, exerting, if necessary, force to that end. I thought it an easy task. What an error I made. The 14-year-old boy was secured and held fast by me. The sisters blindfolded him so as to prevent him from seeing where we were going. I turned my face towards the chapel. Scarcely, however, had we advanced a step in that direction than the boy, who until then had been quiet, became furious and refused to budge. I lifted him up to carry him. He was very heavy, and I had to use all my strength to master him. We made our way to the chapel as best we could, half carrying, half dragging, the unfortunate Taibo. The only noise he made was that of a howling bulldog. The sisters offered assistance and took the boy by his feet, but he slung his legs apart and threw the sisters off. At the step of the chapel, he was raging, whining, and twisted about in my arms like a snake. Suddenly, he twisted his legs around mine, so strongly that nobody could move them. I was fastened as with iron chains and fell sideways against the chapel wall. My shirt was wet with sweat and my breath became very difficult. After a little rest, I labored up the steps with my human burden. I came to the chapel door. It had been opened and I stood at the entrance. On a sudden, the boy was struck as by lightning. He simply collapsed in my arms. He seemed as though dead. Froth covered his mouth. His deep sunk eyes were fast shut. He showed no faintest sign of life. I dragged him as far as the center of the chapel, where we both fell on the floor. For two minutes, the boy remained silent, like a corpse. Then there came a sudden inrush of life, and the boy howled like a ravening dog. Away, he howled. Away with this filth. Let me get out of this pigsty, he raved. A yellow foam gathered on his lips. I wanted to get a good view of his eyes, and for that purpose, I bent over the body. As a reward of my curiosity, he blew the horrible froth into my face. He twisted round like a crushed worm. His howling was terrifying beyond expression. He tried to crawl back to the chapel door, but his movements were now very slow. His weakness caused him to have some strange convulsion movements. It was all horribly gruesome, and the darkness of the night increased our terror. After half an hour, I pulled the boy out of the building. Scarcely had the door closed behind him, than he rose and walked. I took him by the arm and led him back to his room. This scene made a deep impression upon us all. We were speechless, but full of thought, and we were struck with amazement. The boy is deaf. This deafness has been tested in all kinds of ways. He speaks very little during the day, and then like a child with a pure, sweet voice. As soon, however, as the evil spirit begins to speak through him, his tone becomes strong, like that of a powerful bass voice. It becomes husky and difficult to understand. 
He seems to be indifferent to his surroundings. He walks along strangely, like a maniac, never fixing his eyes on a child under six or seven years, never touching any such innocence. Never does he gaze on a religious picture, but he delights in beholding animals. Spiders and toads are his darlings. He is often on the lookout for such vermin and for insects, playing with them, causing them to run up his hands. He would then delight in tearing their legs from their bodies. He eats, as a rule, like an ordinary human being, but at times he turns into a horrible glutton. For example, a little while ago he emptied a big basket full of apples and devoured them to the last one. The sister brings him food, but let her sprinkle it with holy water or touch it with a blessed metal. Although it had been done in the kitchen right out of his sight, he would infallibly know of it. He then will approach the dish, look at it, and say, I am not hungry. There is filth in this food. Or, this food is poisoned. In no circumstances will he touch such food, but always waits for another helping. The same thing happens with liquids. He can never be induced to touch them if any holy water has been put into them, or if any pious object has been brought into contact with them. His favorite expression for a church is solstal, pigsty. For holy water, he uses the terms sawasser or drekwasser, filth water. He calls priests black cows or black guards. In his vocabulary, the religious sisters were patients all covered over with dirt. Catholics he described as dung beetles. The poor afflicted boys themselves were his pups. He had, however, words of praise for Freemasons and rebellious Christians. Such, he maintained, were fine people. They sued us, cried the diabolic spirit. They are protagonists of liberty. He always spoke of them with greatest delight. They render us gentlemen great service, he cried. He always called himself a gentleman, and the devils he designated as his masters. They the Freemasons and disobedient Christians, spare us a lot of trouble, he screeched. They bring many people under our sway, whereas the filthy dung beetles and black cows spoil much of our valuable work, give us great trouble, and take away from us many souls. When the evil spirit speaks through the mouth of the boy, he always casts him in a kind of trance. The body on such occasions appears lifeless. The boy's features are rather handsome but his face is pale and melancholic. He lives and walks about like a person laboring under the burden of a heavy cross. Mm